If you've spent any time in the Ozarks of northern Arkansas or southern Missouri, you're probably familiar with the Crescent Hotel, a beautiful old neo-Gothic hotel overlooking the quirky little tourist town of Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The Crescent calls itself the most haunted hotel in America. And since I grew up about an hour's drive from Eureka Springs, I've heard its many ghost stories my entire life. But what I find more interesting than dubious ghost stories is the very real story of greed, fraud, and murder that took place there in the late 1930s. Because the story of Norman Baker is far weirder than any ghost story. Let's get into it. Hello Darklings and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Delaney, a true crime writer and big time murder nerd. On this channel, I like to take deep dives into some of the worst cases and I tend to cuss a lot. So if you're into that sort of thing, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool. You do you. Today I want to talk about one of my locally infamous characters. I had previously done a video on Norman Baker, but I was a total noob to this whole YouTube thing. So it just looked awful. And because I want you, my viewers, to only have the highest quality experience, I'm trying this again. So let's start over with Norman Baker. Baker was born in Muscatine, Iowa in 1882, the youngest of 10 children. He dropped out of high school his sophomore year and followed in his father's footsteps, becoming a machinist. But his life was changed when he encountered a traveling mentalist show, which is basically a troupe of stage magicians, psychics, and hypnotists. After seeing the show, he recruited his own troupe of performers and toured around the Midwest, where he performed as an illusionist and hypnotist. After a few years, his troupe signed on with a lucrative theater in the vaudeville circuit. After a decade of touring, he married another performer, a stage psychic, and settled back down in Muscatine. He went back to being a machinist and inventor and patented several of his inventions, including a calliophone, which is a kind of portable air-powered organ that would be especially useful to traveling shows. He also had a mail order business, a correspondence art school, and other business ventures that made him quite a bit of money. The calliophone alone earned him $200,000 in a single year, which is over $3 million in today money. Then, in the 1920s, a new form of mass media had emerged, radio. Baker realized its potential right away and wanted in on the action. So, in 1924, he negotiated a deal with the Muscatine Chamber of Commerce. In exchange for free rent and utilities, his new station would make Muscatine famous. He promised he'd broadcast real, honest-to-goodness entertainment that farmers and small-town folks would enjoy. So the chamber obliged, and Baker got his deal. He took the call letters KTNT, which he said stood for Know the Naked Truth. He had the KTNT studio built on top of a hill, along with a gift shop, a restaurant, an excursion boat on the nearby lake, and a large six-pump gas station advertising the lowest prices around. He also frequently violated his broadcast license. KTNT was only licensed to broadcast at 5,000 watts, but Baker would just boost the signal to double that. Since the station was up on top of a hill, he or one of his employees could see if an FCC inspector was on their way, so they'd just dial it back down before the inspector got there. Thanks to the station's illegally large reach, it quickly became one of the most popular stations in the country. On the weekends, thousands of people would flock to the KTNT grounds to listen to Baker's broadcast. At one point, the crowd was estimated to be about 50,000 people. This popularity translated into a lot of money. On an average summer Sunday, his various businesses would rake in about $3,000, which is more than $45,000 in today money. I keep mentioning his income for a reason. Just put a pin in that. And Baker's popularity went all the way to the top. He had supported fellow Iowan Herbert Hoover's 1928 presidential campaign. You know, Hoover, the pro-business president whose fiscal mismanagement severely worsened the Great Depression. Anyway, Baker was credited with winning the Midwest for him. That support earned him a private White House meeting with then-President Hoover. Later, 
Hoover even participated in a publicity stunt that would actually be illegal today. He held a big press conference where he pushed a button that remotely started the printing presses to launch Baker's new tabloid, the Midwest Free Press. The question is, why was Baker so popular? Well, for one thing, his background as a vaudeville performer and mentalist had honed his speaking and performing skills. And Baker broadcast his show in the evening, specifically during the dinner hour, when farmers and workers would be at home listening to the radio, the original prime time. And the show itself might sound familiar to a lot of folks today. Angry, off-the-cuff rants full of anti-education, anti-Semitic, and anti-Catholic tropes. He saw conspiracies everywhere. His business competitors and any unsympathetic newspapers were, quote, publishing lies about him, trying to, quote, shut down the truth. Fake news. He even accused the local PTO of being a communist organization. He also preached good old-fashioned traditional quackery, a lot of which is still floating around today. Stop me if you've heard these. Fluoride in our drinking water is slowly poisoning us. Aluminum, found in pots and pans and antiperspirants, is absorbed into the body and causes all kinds of illnesses. Vaccinations are just a sham, just a plot by doctors and pharmaceutical companies to fleece gullible people. Or worse, they're actually poison that will end up killing you. And of course, big business and the government are conspiring to cover up the truth. Sound familiar? They turn the friggin' frogs gay! His anti-vax ranting even set off what was later called the Iowa Cow War. In 1931, there had been an outbreak of bovine tuberculosis in the Midwest, so the state had mandated TB testing on cattle. Any that tested positive had to be put down, not only to protect other cattle, but anyone who drank milk from an infected cow. But Baker went on his show and claimed that the TB testing program was really just a conspiracy by the state and veterinarians to rip off ranchers. He claimed they would falsify positive test results in order to steal, then sell perfectly healthy cattle. He had enough people swallowing this <clears throat> bullshit that he convinced Iowa ranchers to literally run veterinarians out of town using violence and intimidation rather than submit their herds for testing. The cow war was only stopped when the governor sent in the militia. But Baker's biggest nemesis, the one that he railed on about constantly, was the American Medical Association and doctors in general. He frequently accused the AMA of having a cure for cancer, but keeping it a secret so doctors could make more money on surgeries and radiation therapy. He constantly accused the AMA and anyone else he disagreed with of being nothing but greedy crooks and liars out to squeeze the little folks for every last one of their hard-earned dimes. It's especially ironic because remember, Baker was really, really rich. He dressed in fancy purple and lavender suits, and he had a gold and diamond encrusted tie pin. He even had a customized purple Franklin Roadster outfitted with air conditioning and bulletproof glass. Baker, who remember had dropped out in the 10th grade, called himself a self-taught healer, and his cures were mostly just folk remedies like using an onion poultice to cure appendicitis. But that changed in 1929. That year, he went to Dr. Ozias's cancer clinic in Kansas City, Missouri. Now, Ozias was another wild quack who deserves his own video. But anyway, Ozias, of course, claimed that he had the cure for cancer, a secret proprietary blend of herbs and spices that was actually just corn silk, clover, ground watermelon seeds, and water. So, Baker and Ozias chose five cancer patients to administer their cure to so they could then report on the results. Spoiler alert, all five of the patients died. But that's not what Baker and Ozias said. They publicly claimed that the patients had all miraculously recovered. Back at the KTNT studios, Baker had started taking his broadcasting equipment outside to interact with his audience. At some point, he started performing essentially faith healings including one time cutting away part of a man's skull in front of a crowd of people. No shit. But he knew he needed more than just weekend crowds to hawk his cures to. So in December 1929, he opened the first Baker Institute in Muscatine, where he claimed he could cure everything from constipation to varicose veins to cancer. 
He staffed the place with chiropractors, osteopaths, and diploma mill MDs, calling them the masters of their profession. And of course, he promoted it heavily on KTNT. Now, KTNT had been getting complaints since it first went on the air, but once he started hawking phony cures, the AMA, and specifically Morris Fishbein, the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, began calling for an investigation, and the FTC soon obliged. In 1931, the FTC denied renewing his broadcast license on the grounds of vulgarity, immorality, or indecency. But he still had his newsletter and the Baker Institute. There, he would perform exams on people for $10, which is good money for the mostly poor folks that he was targeting. Every exam would show the patient had the worst case of whatever disease they came in with, or that Baker could make up. Since Baker couldn't technically practice medicine, he had his <clears throat> real doctors do his bidding. He would charge his patients up to $1,000 per treatment, which consisted of regular injections with one or both of his cures. One was Ozias' watermelon seed formula, to which he had begun adding carbolic acid. The other was his own formula, made up of equal parts alcohol, glycerin, and carbolic acid. Remember that. In 1930, JAMA published an article about Baker's, quote, lies, viciousness, and quackery. So Baker fought back in the pages of his newsletter, claiming the AMA was just trying to shut down the truth. He even said they had sent assassins to kill him, but one of the would-be assassins had recognized him as having cured his friend, so he backed out. Sounds legit. And yet another time-honored grifter tactic he used the AMA's attack as an excuse to raise funds for his fight. He then sued the AMA for libel, asking $500,000, a shocking amount of money in those days. He wanted to bring in a long line of former patients to testify on his behalf, but surprise, they had all either gotten worse or died. Former employees testified as to what was in his cure, further proving just how much of a complete fraud he was. Needless to say, his fact-free grandstanding didn't work in a real court of law, and he lost the case. And thanks to what came out at the trial, he was later charged with practicing medicine without a license. So he fled the country. He went to Mexico, specifically the border town of Nuevo Laredo, which sits across the Rio Grande from Laredo, Texas. There he ran a 100,000-watt border blaster station, XENT, where he continued his grandstanding, lying, and attacks against the medical establishment. You know, all the greatest hits. He also, while still in Mexico, ran for governor of Iowa on the farm labor ticket, but he didn't even manage to get on the ballot. However, in 1936, he was able to work out a deal with the new, more sympathetic governor of Iowa, where he would serve just one day in jail and pay a fine of just over $1,000. After his triumphant release, he ran for senator. Again, he lost. Now, no longer able to run a radio station or a cancer clinic and failing as a politician, Baker decided to leave Iowa for good. He set his place on some place where he could be back in business, free from the burdensome government regulations that he faced in Iowa. Some place with fresh air and a healthful reputation. A place like Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The history of the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs reads almost like a Stephen King novel. Well, one specific Stephen King novel. It was designed in 1885 by the renowned architect Isaac Taylor, who would go on to design the St. Louis World's Fair in 1901. Planned to be a grand luxury resort, it was built at a cost of $294,000, which is almost $8.5 million in today money, and would capitalize on the town's reputation for its healing springs. Immigrant laborers from Ireland were brought in to build it, particularly the stonework. According to local legend, one of those stonemasons, a man named Michael, fell to his death, landing in what is now room 218. Regardless, the Crescent, also called the Grand Old Lady of the Ozarks, opened to much fanfare in 1886. Originally, it operated as a year-round resort, but it continually lost money and eventually fell into disrepair. So, starting in 1901, the new owners rented the building to a girls' school during the school year and ran it as a resort in the summer. By 1908, though, it was too run down for tourists, 
So the resort park closed and it only functioned as a girls' school. Again, according to local legend, it was during that time that yet another tragedy befell the residents at the Crescent Hotel. The story goes that one young woman fell or leapt to her death from the hotel balcony. The rumor is that she was pregnant and had committed suicide out of shame. In 1924, the school closed down as well and the building stood empty until 1930. Another school, this time a junior college, opened there but only managed to stay in business for four years. That brings us to 1937, deep in the midst of the Great Depression. Eureka Springs was, and still is, deeply dependent on tourism, so it was hit a lot harder than most other places. So, Baker was able to buy the old abandoned Crescent Hotel for $40,000, which is about $748,000 in today money, which was a steal. Baker planned to turn it into a radio station, pharmacy, and cancer hospital. He promised the Chamber of Commerce that he would run a national ad campaign for his new hospital, which would all but guarantee a steady stream of visitors and their money. So the Chamber welcomed him with a lavish dinner where the mayor acted as MC. But not everyone was as enthralled by Baker's promises. One state representative lobbied for a congressional investigation into his claims, but he was apparently outvoted. Meanwhile, Baker spent some $50,000 renovating the grand old lady, painting the interior in bright carnival-style colors, especially his favorite color, lavender. He moved all his staff, along with 140 patients, from his Muscatine Center to Eureka Springs. He also launched a $1 million ad campaign, hyping up the fresh air and crystal healing waters of Eureka Springs. Like he had before, he promised desperate, sick people that his miracle cure would make them well again. People with cancer and all kinds of other diseases flocked to the Baker Cancer Hospital, many signing away their life savings in the process, which is also sadly familiar. Regardless of whatever disease they were suffering from, the treatments were the same. Injections with one of his two formulas four times a day, every day, except Sunday because even diseases need to take a day off. The <clears throat> doctors on Baker's staff would later testify that they jokingly referred to themselves as machine guns since they were giving so many injections in such a rapid succession. It wasn't long though before locals who worked at the Baker Cancer Hospital started noticing suspicious goings on. Soon after its opening, one entire wing was soundproofed and sealed off behind a door that was locked from the outside. It was labeled the psychiatric wing and the patients who weren't getting any better were sent there. Another thing the local workforce noted, patients were often declared cured even when they were clearly in worse shape than when they arrived. It was later revealed that those patients would return home only to die within days. Some didn't even make it that long. They died on the train ride home. Rumors began to circulate among the locals, like that Baker was conducting medical experiments on patients in the basement morgue, or that he was spiriting away the deceased patients via underground tunnel to a crematorium in town. None of these rumors can be confirmed, and as a point of fact, there were never any tunnels beneath the Crescent. What can be confirmed is that 44 patients died at the Baker Cancer Hospital during the 20 months it was in operation. Since these folks were already dying of fatal diseases like cancer, they weren't autopsied and no investigations were conducted into their deaths. Which brings me to something that none of the ghost tours or history books ever mention. Everyone agrees that Baker was a quack and a fraud and his patients were cheated and died because they didn't get the medical treatments they needed. But I say he wasn't just a quack and a cheat. He was a serial killer. Hear me out. Both of the formulas he was injecting into his patients contained carbolic acid, which is a powerful poison that can cause organ failure. In fact, around this same time, the Nazis had begun using this exact method, injections of carbolic acid, to euthanize inmates in his concentration camps. But unfortunately, we'll never know for sure. Baker was arrested in September 1939 on mail fraud charges, 
After a three-week trial, he, along with two other <clears throat> doctors at his hospital, was convicted and sentenced to three years in Leavenworth Prison. After his sentence, as the assets of Norman Baker Incorporated were being divided up by the courts, it was discovered that Baker had engaged in yet another crime, embezzlement. He had been withdrawing money out of the corporation's bank account. He would then give that money in cash to Thelma Yount, his personal secretary, who would then smuggle it into Nuevo Laredo, where she would hide it in a safe deposit box. In all, he'd embezzled $1 million, but he was never charged for it. After Baker served his time, he tried to open another research center in Muscatine, but the city refused permission. He eventually retired to live on his yacht in Florida near Miami. In rather poetic justice, he developed liver cancer. Rather than submit to the medical treatment he had made his fortune shitting on, he went to the famous Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium. He died in 1958 at the age of 75. The Crescent Hotel continued its pattern of having new owners pour money into it, only to lose that money, abandon it, and let it fall into disrepair. Rinse, repeat. It wasn't until the 1970s that guests began reporting unexplained phenomena that were attributed to ghosts. Mysterious vapors, ghostly figures, sounds coming from empty rooms, and objects moved even though no one was around. The current owners lean heavily on its reputation as being haunted, and they are the ones who call it the most haunted hotel in America. Several paranormal researchers, including the ghost hunters, have visited the Crescent and claim to have captured paranormal activity there. Hunters. Taps travels to Arkansas to investigate a haunted hotel with a macabre history. The Dr. Baker era specifically is believed to have created many of the apparitions that are said to wander the halls of the grand old lady. It's also the most capitalized on. The hotel's penthouse bar was formerly called Dr. Baker's Lounge, and its current restaurant serves various drinks and dishes named after or alluding to the infamous killer. And the grand old lady's dark reputation lives on. In 2017, a guest walked out of that bar and fell over the staircase railing inside, falling four stories to his death. More recently, in 2019, a groundskeeper accidentally unearthed a cache of buried bottles on the grounds, bottles containing human tissue. Find the historical Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs and encased below this plexiglass artifacts uncovered during a February landscaping project. We don't see jars like that, that particular style, uh, come out of the ground very often. Mike Evans says they are connected to Norman Baker, the 1930s entrepreneur and convicted swindler who claimed to have the cure for cancer. Which sparked renewed media attention and popular curiosity. Many of those bottles are now prominently displayed in the basement, Baker's former morgue, only accessible by one of the many ghost tours that are run out of the Crescent. If you're still here, thank you so much for sticking with this long, weird story. Be sure and click the like button and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Had you heard of Dr. Baker or the Crescent Hotel? Till next time, darklings. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more. You can help me make more true crime content by supporting me on Patreon, where for as little as a cup of coffee, you can get early access to videos, bonus content, and free Murder Nerd merch. The link is in the description.